My message today is on the titles of God, and uh, I just have to confess, this is not one that you're necessarily going to say, what a blessing to my life, and uh, not one that's going to necessarily challenge you to do something amazing for God this week, <clears throat> but I believe it to be necessary information. I believe it to be something that you and I, as uh, uh, Bible-trained, as, as educated Christians, ought to know. And what I'm talking about here is that most of what we call God are actually titles. The titles of God. So, let me uh, take you into this. The, technically, we should distinguish between the name of God and his many titles. Now, let me use myself as an example, not of God, but of names and titles. My birth name is John. I come from a long line of uh, men named John, and uh, it was John. My wife was looking at it recently. What is it? John Nathan and John Henry? Chester. Or <laughs> Chester. John Chester, yeah. And then my dad was John Edward, and so then he uh, changed the tradition of changing the middle name, and named me John Edward Jr. But that meant that he was John and I was John, so if my mom wanted to call us quickly, they changed my name to Jack because John was so long and complicated. <laughs> uh, but uh, So I was Jack, and you know, it was funny to me because I remember getting ready to go to kindergarten. I'd grown that old, and uh, my, uh, my mom took me aside and said, now when you get there, uh, they're going to probably call you John. And I laughed. And I said, and she said, and that's your real name. And I laughed again because I knew what my name was. <laughs> and um, I, just, I had just graduated from being Jackie uh, to kindergarten Jack. So anyway, my, my birth name is actually John. That's on the uh, birth certificate. Now, right away, then, I was given the additional nickname that I use almost exclusively, and that is Jack. That Johann turned into John. That's why there's an H in John, the German Johann. And then uh, the French was Jacques, and that was the same basic name, so that's where Jack comes from. John Donne, the august theologic uh, poet, uh, before he was John Donne, the, uh, the saved person, he was Jack Donne, the love poet. <laughs> and uh, so kind of a... I'll play on the on the terms there, I think. Now, those both are in some form a name, but one is a nickname. You see it's a name used in place of a name. Now, at the church, people often call me pastor. And in fact, some call me that exclusively. They would not call me by my first name uh, because there is something of the honor of the title. Now, pastor means shepherd. I don't know if that is disillusioning or anything, but that, that's what it was. I had one lady that couldn't pronounce pastor very well. She called me pastor, and I, I thought, well, pretty close, you know, the idea of, of a shepherd. When my children were home, they called me by the title father or dad or daddy. And uh, to hear them say daddy brought, uh, it was a beautiful experience. But technically, it's not my name. I didn't correct them because that was as good a name as any. And for the most part, they still call me dad. Um, that became a specialized name, and that's, that's fine. But they recognize that it is a title, it's a position, rather than a name. And so it is with God. He has shared his name with us, we ought to know that, but he has many titles that we may use in the place of his name. It's just that we should know the difference. All right, so let's look then, what is actually the name of God? Well, his name is Yahweh. You say, what? I never heard of that. Yeah, the Hebrew Yahweh, and I think you can uh, see it there. If you look at the Hebrew letters, Hebrew reads from right to left. And so if you see the Y-H-W-H, -H, then next to it you have that little apostrophe. That's the Yod. 
and that's the Y sound. Then the hey is that thing with like two, two legs on it, like a table with two legs, but the leg doesn't reach all the way to the table. Um, that's the hey, that's the H. Then the wow or the vowel is the uh, W sound and then another H sound. So uh, reading from right to left, W H or Y H W H, Yahweh. Uh, we figure that's about as close as we can get to the pronunciation. Now the King James Version usually translates Yahweh as Lord with a capital O R D. You see the smaller capitals. So if you're reading King James and you get to that, you know he's talking. He's using there his name, or somebody is using his name, uh, using that uppercase O R D. In some verses, they translated it Jehovah. We'll get to that in a moment, but here are the verses. Uh, we see Exodus 6, 3, and I, God is speaking to uh, Moses here. I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. Now you see here, he calls it a name. It's not wrong to call them a name. It's just that technically those are titles. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Then Psalm 83, 18 that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high, God, uh, most high over all the earth. There are many beings, invented beings, that are called God, that are called Lord, that might even be called Almighty, though in a very limited sense. But thy, his name alone is Jehovah. Isaiah 12, 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord Jehovah. Now this is the name, but a, a, sort of the nickname, the, the shortened form of Yah, and then Yahweh. Yah, Yahweh. And perhaps doubled for emphasis, or perhaps just to show the variations, I don't know. But Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Again, in Isaiah 26, 4, Trust ye in the Lord, Jehovah, forever, for in the Lord Jehovah, Yah, Yahweh, is everlasting strength. Now you say, you're saying Yahweh and then you're saying Jehovah. Doesn't sound quite the same. Well, the derivation of the English word Jehovah is kind of an interesting study <coughs> in misunderstanding. Let me take you back to the way the Jews uh, worked. For fear of taking the name of the Lord in vain, they never said Yahweh. They just refused to do that. Even in the reading of the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, what they did was that they marked the word so that when they came to that, they would know to substitute another word in its place. Now, the Hebrew language uh, early on did not have vowels. You imagine reading all of our English words without vowels. Mary had a little M, M, R, Y, I guess, uh, uh, had H, D, L, T, T, L, you know. And so the thing it was with the uh, Hebrew language, you had to pretty well know what it said before you could really read it very well. And, um, but that's the way it was. So um, you just had the consonants, although some of the consonants we would think of as vowels today. So Yahweh looked like this. You see the, again, the, the apostrophe, the Yah, H, the Wow, H. And so uh, that's what it looked like. Didn't have any distinguishing. But when others tried to learn Hebrew, they added in what is called vowel points. And if you look at a Hebrew Bible today, normally it will have Little, little dots and marks and little tiny T's and things like this at the bottom of the words. Those are vowel points, and they, they carry a certain vowel uh, sound. So Yahweh would have looked like this. You see the Y, we're turning it back around in English order here, the Y and then a little A and then the H for the Yah, and then the W would be the W and the little E and the H. So that would have taken the person who was not familiar with the word and told them how to pronounce it. So um, what happened was the Jews had marked the word and they didn't want to say Yahweh. 
They wanted to say the other title, Adonai, Adonai, and that means Lord or Master. So they wanted to change it uh, in the reading out loud. To signal this change in the reading, they made a nonsense word. They put the vowel points for Adonai, there at the corner, the, um, the slash with the two little things, that's the uh, Aleph, and then the, the D and the N, and then the, the apostrophe again, the Y sound. <clears throat> so they put in the vowel points for that into the word Yahweh. Now the nonsense word, was nonsense to them, looked like this. The Y-A-H-O-W-A-Y-H. The Adonai verb or vowel sounds put into the Yahweh consonants. Now that's pretty much like Jehovah, isn't it? You see? And so when, uh, especially when non-Jewish readers read it, and, and they, we, we've taken the spelling from the German because the Yah in German is spelled J-A, so that uh, came out Jehovah. All right, now, Jehovah has years of usage behind it, so I, when I speak of the word, I generally say Jehovah just has a history with me. Um, and the term Yahweh is, is pretty much a, a foreign sounding thing. But uh, I, I, one preacher that I've heard uh, giving into the fact that we are not exactly sure how it was earlier pronounced, they would uh, just simply say the letters, Yahe, Wahe. <laughs> and that sounds like a, a, another word altogether, Yahe, Wahe. Um, almost sounds like pig Latin. But um, there you go, uh, the origin of that uh, form. So, Yahweh sounds very strange to us, but that is the name of God. Now, as any name, my name John, for instance, has a meaning. It comes from the Hebrew origin, meaning God's grace. So the name Yahweh has a meaning. Now, no one named God, of course. There was nobody around to name him. He, he gave that name. He took the name. He didn't need a name when it was just him. <clears throat> I don't think any of the tr Trinity had a name. They just knew each other. Um, when my wife and I were first married, we, we noticed we didn't really call each other by name. We just started talking, and that's who we were, that was the only person there. So, um, but he, he took a name to communicate essential truth to Moses. Here's the passage where we find him explaining this. Exodus 3, 13 and 14. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, because God told him to go, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? So he looks forward and says, I'm going to be in trouble here because I don't know your name. What shall I say unto them? So God answered. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Now that was a surprise, wasn't it? Doesn't sound like a name. Doesn't sound like Rhonda. Doesn't sound like Jimmy. Um, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now, he gives, he gives the truth. I am that I am. I simply am. If we think what's going on here, Moses had grown up in Egypt. Now, he had a Hebrew mother who had taught him of the true God and all that. But all around him were the, the pagan Egyptian gods. Now, they had the god of the Nile, they had the god of the desert, they had the god of the flies, they had a lot of things of that in, in Egypt. And um, so the name of the god, they had the god of heaven, they had god of night, day, and stuff like that. And what it did was it delineated, it defined, it put the boundaries around what that god was and did, you see. Now, 
the transcendent God has no boundaries. <laughs> there is uh, nothing that he is a God of any more than anything else. And there is nothing that he is not the God of, you see. So his answer to this, seeking what are you the God of? Who are you the God of? See, there was a God of the Amorites, a God of the Egyptians. Um, and uh, what, what powers do you have? And where, where does that power end? Are you the God of the hills, the God of the valleys? And he says, I am that I am. <laughs> this is so broad. Uh, he says, I exist. So tell them, I am, have sent you. Now, in this, uh, all three uses of I am is the Hebrew word, and I'll show you the word there. Starts with the uh, Adav, and uh, it's Strong's 1961, if you want to look that up, Haya. The verb means to be, and it is the Cal imperfect form emphasizing a continual existing. I am. Am I continually exist. When Moses then later spoke to Pharaoh, he said that the one who sent him was he is. A little change in the Hebrew here. God said, I am. Moses related it. He is, has sent me. Same. Or he continues to exist. The very choice of name indicates the transcendence of God. If you stop to think about it, you know, the the questions that, that Moses would have been asking, that people normally ask about uh, people's gods. If, you were, if one asks when God lived, or when he lives, the only answer is, he is. <laughs> See? Uh, when uh, he continues. If one asks where God lives, the only answer is, he is. Where? Yes, everywhere. Okay. And uh, here is that mind expanding, if not blowing, concept of his transcendence, his going beyond any finite uh, boundaries. Now, this name, God uses his name Yahweh, which is Strong's 3068, 6,519 times in a total of, in the King James, 5,521 verses. I have a computer that works that out for me. All right, that is the name, and that's the uh, story of the name. Now, in the time remaining, let me go over just a few of the titles. Now, we were singing uh, King of Heaven, you know. Well, that's a title, isn't it? Um, that's not a name, that's his title. So uh, normally all of these things are linked, lumped into the, uh, the names of God. And that's not bad. It's not misunderstanding. But here are titles of God. All the other names are actually titles. While we may use them in the place of his name, and, and certainly when I pray, I call him Father far more than I ever called him Yahweh, you see. Because uh, the same way with my dad. I called him Dad. I didn't call him John. See. All right. In fact, my wife got into the habit after I became pastor at Open Door uh, to when she was referring to me, to people of the church, she called me pastor. <laughs> and um, it was a conscious decision to refer to me in that title, you see. All right. So we may use them in the place of his name, but we should know the difference. It seems to me that... Um, uh, I, I am just a little lacking if I don't give you that understanding. All right, let's look first of, it all, first of all at the Hebrew titles. And I'm, I'm just looking at what's normally called his names, but, but actually are titles. And the first one is Elohim. This is full of interesting uh, twists and turns. So Elohim, the um, uh, I am ending is a plural in the Hebrew. Now, uh, I'll mention this again, but uh, they have, we have singular and plural in English, and that's, that's it. Hebrew has singular, dual, and plural. 
Singular is one, dual is two, and then plural is three or more. Find that interesting because Elohim means at least three, you see. All right. It is used 2,606 times in 2,249 verses. Now, what is that meaning of this title? And some have uh, spoke, spoken of three possible meanings of the plural title of God. Now, the first two that I'm going to give you are just wrong. And yet the second one is very often expounded as uh, the right answer, but I'll explain to you why not. The evolutionary meaning, first of all, the first meaning uh, given that we uh, read about in some of the old, old books is that uh, it's a throwback to the rationalistic evolutionary theory of religion. The idea is that uh, all religions began with cavemen around a campfire going ug oog and uh, seeing lightning and saying, ah, cowering and there must be a god. And, and uh, so they would have um, multiple gods, multiple gods. And then finally, as they became educated, it became rational and a little more uh, wise and civilized. They uh, worked it down to one. Now, all of the history that we've ever come up with shows it was just the opposite, that almost all of the great religions started with one god and then uh, began to devolve into multiple gods. So anyway, this is just, you know, tells a story that fit their narrative, but had nothing to do with actuality. So this theory has been thoroughly disproved and is abandoned by all who keep up with the liberal conversation. Uh, nobody's really trying to hold on to that unless you think you're dealing with some newbie that's never heard of this before. The second meaning that has captured the attention of a lot of people, and I was surprised in the uh, uh, textbook that I have chosen for teaching theology at uh, at Heritage is uh, by um, a man that I really like and uh, got his name down here someplace. Um, Charles Ryrie, Charles Ryrie, of course. Charles Ryrie, he was the guy who wrote Dispensationalism Today and became, was at the forefront of, uh, uh, of explaining dispensationalism, which is literal Bible interpretation. Uh, to uh, Christians so that they could escape out of the Reformed theology. All right, all of that to say. Uh, the majestic plural is the, uh, the idea, and you remember the queen, it was Queen um, Victoria who has said that when she heard a crude joke, she said, we are not amused. We are not amused. That was the majestic plural, we. Well, Elohim cannot be the majestic plural. That's it. Because this was neither known at the time of the writing of scriptures. Nobody had invented that meaning yet, that use. Nor was it used in the East. When it was used, it was only used, it was first used in, in England. Research shows that Henry II of England made the earliest verifiable use of the majestic plural. I went to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Encyclopedia of Britain, to find out about Henry II, and uh, i show you the whole thing there, but uh, what I highlighted, he was born 1133, and he died 1189. It was 1169 when, in his response, uh, he said, we, and it's been called the majestic plural. What he was probably actually saying and let me skip on down to the uh, Wikipedia. Don't believe uh, everything you read in Wikipedia. You know, I, uh, my, my son told me of a friend of his who came up with a strange little phrase that he went into Wikipedia and altered, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 different uh, articles to add this in as though he knew the people. And, and it was just, just messing with it. But uh, Wikipedia... Uh, claims that uh, concerning the majestic pearl, it was first recorded use was in 1169 when King Henry II, hard pressed by his barons over the investiture controversy, assumed the common theory of divine right of kings, that I am a king by, the, uh, by God's order. So I rule by God's pleasure. 
and that monarch uh, acted conjointly with deity. Hence, he used we, meaning God and I. <clears throat> we, I speak for God, we uh, hold to this. So, something that began in England in, in 1169, that's a long time ago, but uh, a long time after Moses. <laughs> a long time after the use of Elohim. So, claiming that Moses would have used the majestic plural is at least anachronistic, meaning out of, out of any pro possible time scheme, and possibly playing into the hands of the Christ-rejecting rabbis who, after the fact, uh, tried to prove that Elohim did not refer to the triunity that Christians were saying they did. All right. Um, we should mention that... Uh, uh, the early church fathers, they all believed in this. So let's look at that, the triunity meaning. Even the theologically sound theologian Charles Ryrie, along with others, reject this meaning because he says it's reading New Testament revelation into the Old Testament. This is just poor thinking. You see... Uh, most evidence shows that the early church fathers considered Elohim a reference to the triunity, so it is not false hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the, the science of interpretation. Uh, you would use that if you're translating one language into another at all. Here's, here's the fact. God was always who he was, who he is. He has not changed. So, when he was speaking to Adam, when he was speaking to Abraham, when he was speaking to Jacob, when he was speaking to Moses, he was the triune God. See? So that would have come out, if he intended it at all, while he was speaking to them. And how much more with the name, the title, Elohim. It is uh, sometimes translated in the Old Testament as gods because it's used of the pagan gods. It is sometimes used of beings who, of, of power, like the judges. They are sometimes called Elohim. But when it is used of the God, it is also called Elohim because he is plural, three in one. All right, so God would have spoken within the triunity because that's who he is. There is nothing inconsistent about finding God communicating the triunity in the Old Testament. And then and, and Charles Ryrie goes right on ahead and shows how many verses picture Father, Son, and sometimes even the Holy Spirit. So he contradicts himself in this. All right, that is the first of these titles that I want to get into today. Uh, and this is in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. The second word is Adonai. I've mentioned that before. And it is used 434 times in 419 verses. And this is the word that means master or Lord. Uh, even sir would be the idea. The one in control. So I'm just going to list those two in the Hebrew Bible. Because uh, the rest are pretty well understood. Like uh, Pastor Emiru is saying that our God is a rock and a fortress. See? Well, these are clearly symbolic references. Uh, thou my, my rock, my salvation. These are titles that express things. But we, we catch that. We get that. This is, this is symbolic. All right. Sometimes we didn't understand that with Elohim and Adonai. All right. Uh, Adonai, I think your best pronunciation for the D is, is to take a TH sound and make it sound like a D. The ad, ad, Adonai, like it's not TH but DH. Adonai. All right, in case you wanted to practice that. Let's look then to close at the Greek titles, and I have four of them for you. The one which makes a lot of sense is God, and this is the, uh, the Greek word theos. You see it here in the Greek, Strong's 2316, theos. It is used three, 1,343 times in 1,172 verses. Um, and this is the word that simply means God. It is used of false gods, imaginary gods uh, as well, but it is the word God. 
But of course, it, there is a true God, and therefore God is a proper title. Uh, God meaning the one who is godlike. All right, the second one is Lord. And this is the word kurios, not curious, but kurios. And um, it is used 748 times in 687 verses. The title means Lord or Master. And again, um, in, in formal language, the slave would call his master Lord, kurios. Uh, sometimes the verb form is uh, someone who has mastered something or mastered someone, conquered them. And uh, that would be the verb form of kurios. So he is called Lord and Master. You think about that, who he was in the beginning. Uh, aside from creation, aside from salvation, aside from all the things that he's done, who he is in, in the triune God um, he would be loved one. He would be the one that they cared about and so on. Uh, not, not Lord, you see. This is, this is a title given, uh, taken to himself uh, after creation and salvation. The third one is one that uh, isn't that evident in the reading of the English, but it is uh, master, it is despotes. We have the word despot, meaning a, even a dictator. Usually it's used in a very kind of a bad sense, one who makes you do what you... Uh, a dictator literally means one who dictates and you obey. You see? So there it is, despotes. Despotes. It's used ten times in ten verses. And this is the meaning of absolute master. Absolute ruler. If we compare synonyms, which is valuable to do, and we compare it to kurios, for instance, <clears throat> despotes relates only to a slave and denotes, the, the, definition, the uh, dictionary meaning, is absolute ownership, uncontrolled, unlimited, unrestricted power. While kurios has a wider meaning of mastery without absolutism. So a servant, a true servant, would have a master, as, as you working at a job would have somebody who tells you what to do. It would be your master, you see. You don't call him master, probably. Um, but um, um, but he, he can't tell you to do whatever he wants and you have to do it. Then you would be a slave. All right. The last one, then, is father. And while that's such a tender word, and the word that I uh, tend to call God uh, by when I'm speaking to him personally in prayer, uh, it actually is a title. You recognize it doesn't have meaning until after creation, and he created us to have a, a husband and wife, father and mother, and children, you see. And so... He wanted that situation to occur so that we, speaking of our Father, would understand our relationship to Him, the relationship that He wanted to have with us when He brings us into His family. Uh, he invented family, fatherhood, so that He could communicate that to us. It is pater. Interesting that uh, throughout the world, uh, uh, Papa, Mama, these terms are throughout almost all the languages. Um, now it's, uh, uh, German turns it to Vater with the V, Vater, and we have Father, but um, Pater, uh, paternal, all these terms come from the Greek term. So it is used of God 260 times in 232 verses, and the title refers to the relationship of Father. Um, while in human terms, the father is one who contributes to the birth of a child, God uh, does not do that with God the Son. Uh, but it is speaking only of the relationship is father-like and son-like. And that evidently by the choice of those persons of the triunity. So, the technical concept, dividing the idea of the name from the titles and explaining the titles 
um, by uh, what it refers to. Uh, Elohim being the El, the God, Ohim, plural, uh, the three person God. And uh, so we have a better understanding of what we're dealing with as we read the scripture concerning our God. This is one of those things where I need to ask. Does this bring up something? Does this uh, prompt a question? Does this say that uh, maybe you discovered a little bit of this on your own or something? Anybody want to share with the class? <laughs> All right. Yes, Gary. Exactly. Now we'll be looking at that tonight, uh, the Old Testament contribution to the uh, doctrine of the triunity. And uh, you've already taken one of my points, so my, my sermon's a lot shorter now. <laughs> I'll give you some details, though. All right, thank you. All right, let's stand together for closing prayer. We'll sing also, but uh, we'll have closing prayer. Father, how we thank you for teaching us of yourself. We ask that you might help us to recognize that the very words we use to describe you when they are scriptural are in fact given us by thee, inspired of thee. While the prophets wrote, you inspired the writing, not just their minds, not just their thinking, but the very writing itself. That's what inspiration is. We ask that you might so guide and direct us to weigh the words that we read in the scripture as not just merely from men and certainly not just from the minds of men. For we know that the, the prophets, after they wrote, went back and studied their own writing to discover the meaning. We ask that you might help us to realize that you wrote through them and they needed to study it as well. We ask that you might help us to see then that you have revealed to us and have actually um, built your human history in such a way that we could understand what a, a king was, what a father was, what a son was, what a family was, what loving parental care was. And you did this so that we might have a glimpse of your feeling toward us and your authority toward us. We ask that you might help us then as we read to take these words and understand that while Jehovah or Yahweh is your name, and that is the, the meaning of I am, I exist. We uh, also thank you for the titles that fill in uh, your power, your authority, your right to tell us what to do. We pray thy blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.